Welcome back to Coloring Through the Bible. My name is Keegan Harkins, and today we're taking a look at the first part of Exodus chapter 15 today. This is the part that's usually labeled the Song of Moses and Miriam. It is the retelling of one of the most epic things that has happened in the Bible, where the Israelites are fleeing Egypt and they come to the edge of the Red Sea. So they're stuck between the sea on one side and all of Pharaoh's army coming at them on the other side. But God intervenes with something miraculous and huge and epic. He parts the Red Sea so that the Israelites can walk through on dry ground. And we're not talking a few hundred people. We're talking, you know, 600,000 people and their livestock, their goats, their sheep, their cattle, their carts filled with all of their possessions. This is a, a huge, massive movement across the Red Sea. And as soon as they get to the other side, God makes the waters crash back down on top of Pharaoh's army and drowns all of them. Well, there are some people that say this didn't really happen because it's too extraordinary. It's too miraculous. It's too out of what you can see happening naturally. But isn't that just like God? He can do the unimaginably big and huge and epic and miraculous. And there's actually photographic evidence of coral on the bottom of the Red Sea that grew in the shape of wheels and spokes and chariots because they started to grow on what was left of Pharaoh's army. And as time went on, there just became this huge pad of coral in the shape of what it had attached to, proving yet again that the Bible is true, that what is in it, even if it's big and huge and something that isn't seen on a regular basis, it's still true. Because God can do the big and the huge and the epic. But does that mean that he doesn't move in small ways? This reminds me of a story that's told in 2 Kings. In 2 Kings chapter 19, it's retelling the story of the Assyrians attacking the city of Jerusalem. Now, the Assyrians were a force to be reckoned with. Everybody was scared of them. They were, were going across the world, you know, just conquering city after city after city. And they were very good at it. When they laid siege to a city, they did it with precision. They knew exactly what they were doing. They had, you know, great artillery. They, they had a way of building an earthenwork ramp right over the top of the city's walls. So there wasn't any wall that could be high enough. It would just take them a little bit longer to go over the top of it. They were, they were scary and terrifying to the people who lived in the land. And here they had come and Israel or Jerusalem is directly in their path. And they've camped all around the city. Well, God sends Isaiah to King Hezekiah and says, don't worry, God is going to fight this battle for you. In fact, you don't have to do anything. Just sit back and watch what God's going to do. Now, if somebody tells you that, you're going to probably assume that something big like the parting of the Red Sea is going to happen. So I can just imagine them sitting and looking out the window and waiting for the earth to open up and swallow all of this army or, or fire and brimstone to come down from heaven and destroy them. But God says through the prophet Isaiah in verse 35 that an angel of the Lord was sent into the camp and killed, you know, three quarters of Assyria's army. Okay, like um, 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp is what verse 35 says. 185,000 men killed in one night. So the Bible doesn't tell us exactly how they died, just that they did, that the angel put these men to death. Well, fortunately for us, Assyrian history books do tell us what happened. And not only the Assyrians, the Egyptians wrote about this event. Um, Herodotus wrote about this event. It's been well recorded in lots of different cultures because it was something monumentous that was done in a very small, ordinary way. So during the night, 
a huge horde of field mice flooded the camp. Now I've seen videos in Australia where there is so there's so many mice, a river of mice running down the road. And that's kind of what I imagine, just a horde of mice flooding into this Assyrian camp. And they ate everything. They ate their food, they ate their ropes, they ate the quivers on their arrows, they ate everything. They destroyed all the ammunition and all their supplies. But the other thing that they did was they brought with them the plague. It's just like in the Renaissance times, the Black Death was brought by rats. The plague was brought by these field mice, and it was a fast-moving plague. And as they ran through the camp, they bit people. They left little mice pellets everywhere that, of course, you know, you got the hantavirus, and you breathe that stuff in. It makes you very, very sick and kill you. Well, all of this just brought this plague back. And when they woke up in the morning, there was, you know, three quarters of their army was either dead or in various stages of plague. And there was nothing left, no food, no supplies, no ropes, no arrows. It was just complete devastation. So the Assyrian army just ran away because it was too much to handle. So here we've seen two accounts where God moved in two completely different ways. On the one, he parted the waters and did something miraculous and big, a huge show of his power. And in the other, it was still a huge show of his power, but he used something ordinary, a mouse, a whole bunch of them. And sometimes I think that we limit God when we put him in a box of how he can move. God doesn't have to fit into what we think is the way that God should move on our behalf. Is a miracle any less of a miracle if it's small or uses ordinary means to bring it about? If you're sick and God sends a doctor who has been taught and knows what he's doing and he can make you well, is that not a miracle? Or does it have to be the heavy heart, light shines down and instantly you're well? Because God can do it both ways. But just because it's one way or the other, does that mean that God didn't do it? We put God in a box when we think that he has to move in a certain way. And we miss so many miracles that God sends us when we're so busy looking for the, the lightning and the thunder. And sometimes he uses a doctor or a mouse. Now, it's not to say we shouldn't expect God to part the waters because that's in his wheelhouse too. So my encouragement to you today is to pay attention because when God moves miracles happen. And if you're looking for a miracle in your life, pray and ask the Lord and then expect the unexpected and expect the expected. Don't limit how God's going to meet that need for you. Just trust that he will. Because maybe he'll send you a lifeboat and maybe He'll send you a helicopter, or maybe he'll just pick you up and put you on dry land. It doesn't matter how God does it. The fact is, he can. So I just want to encourage you today to keep an eye open for those miracles. Keep an eye open for all the ways that God moves, whether he's moving in big ways or small. I hope you have a truly blessed day, and I will see you tomorrow.